Welcome to the Editor's Note Comics Podcast. I think that this world it needs men that are willing to make the hard call. Central Maine's best comics podcast, by default. Ain't no thing like me, Seth Lee. Here are your hosts, Zach and Jared. Matt's coming. No. When do we start? Hey, we're here. We're near. Get used to it. I that is that's how it goes, right? Uh, a no. B your show openings continue to get worse and worse and worse. You need to spend some time here and get creative on how you open the show. If you're gonna be the guy that opens the show, you've got to get more creative. Okay, because so- you could you sound like. You could care less. You couldn't care less. I mean, I cer- could certainly care less. I care quite a bit. That well, when you open the show, like, oh, we're back, we're here. It makes it sound like it's a chore for you to do this every Tuesday with me. This isn't the half ass. This is a whole ass effort. Oh yeah, see, I understand. You'd rather be a whole ass than a yeah. I get that. All right. Speaking of on air things, do you have a thing to potentially announce? Uh, I want to keep that under wraps for the moment. I want to keep it on the, what we say. The DL. So maybe a thing I'll tweet about. Maybe a thing I won't. I'd say let's keep this on the DL. Let's keep this. Let's not count our chickens before they hatch. Let's let's let the process. Let's trust the process and let it play itself out. I'm not cutting this. I'm going to leave it in. And make it a mystery. Yeah, there we go. Trust the process. Let it play itself out. The you're being more preemptive than I ever dreamed of being on this. So well, I am going to tweet about it if I have the opportunity to. Yes. Let's just say that the power of the podcast is starting to flex some muscle. <laughs> Thank God someone's going to profit off this. And you know what? It's not me. For the for all the time and hour and effort, the hour, one hour. I've given you one good hour in the last year and a half. 75. Well, remember, Episode 75. Oh, so I've given you 75 hours. That's over, uh, that's what, close to three days. So no, yeah, nope, 70, that's three days and change. We shouldn't do math on this show. That's what I've learned. Yes. Really, what we always... There are a lot of sad minutes of us just trying to do basic yes. math. What we promise you, though, on this show is at least five good minutes. We've upped it, apparently. Yes. You know why? Because we're at 74 episodes. 75. 75? Oh, that's our... Uh, what is that? What anniversary is 75? Golden is 50. Is it like the silver or is it the diamond anniversary? Should you, get... you, should you be getting me a present? I mean... We've already, we've already gone past wood. That's the fifth one, right? You don't get anything until episode 101 because I did an episode without you. Oh, yeah, you did, didn't you? Yeah. But it's the show's. It's the show's anniversary. Let's see. Anniversary gifts. All right. Anniversary gifts. uh, Buy. Oh, no, I don't want to buy one. Um, Buy me a gift. Buy year. Buy me a gift. I'm not a gift. More specifically, yes, a gift. Or a a gift. I can afford a gift. Yeah, like uh, the fifth one. Was was I said was wood right? Ten is tin or aluminum. Modern diamond jewelry for the tenth anniversary. So for episode seventy five, we should be at diamond. Where's my diamond, Zach? Um, you were gonna get one, but then you wore black socks with Birkenstocks, so I felt the need to give you nothing. I feel like you were lying. You did compliment me earlier when I arrived at your house, though. Not on the sock sandal combo. No, I wasn't expecting that. Not on the that. black s- sock brown sandal combo. Hey, listen, I wear what I wear. We're gonna just chalk up the black sock brown uh, Birkenstock combination to my laziness after football practice. So I guess we have no announcements. No, no announcements. How was the uh, the big event, the big brouhaha at the Editor's Note Comic Store with uh, friend of the podcast Steve Levine? It was good. Good steady crowd. That's all I have to say. Is it was good. Yeah, it was good. It was really A lot of good. people come in and out. Oh, it was steady the entire time. Yeah? Was there a line out around the block? No, but it it was never too busy to bottleneck, but busy enough that it was consistent and quite loud. Was he happy to see uh, his turtle again in the chimney? Well, he, yeah, he came in because I have all these signs right, like, please do not touch. He comes and he just starts like, I'm touching it. I'm touching it. Well, I think he's earned the right to. It's time for the news. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? It's time for the news. See, now that's how you do a show open. You relate to each other. You kind of banter a little bit. You draw the listener in with with funny anecdotes and stories and humanize yourself. News for the week. 
The director of King Kong vs. Godzilla came out and said that we're going to see a more battle-torn, older, brutal Kong, and this movie will have a definitive winner. None of this 50-50 crap like we've seen in versus movies in the past. The definitive winner like um, Floyd Mayweather being the definitive winner on Saturday night. Oh yeah, once they hit round six. Once they hit round six, it started to turn and it was over in round Did 10. you see it? Yeah, I watched it live. Oh, I did not I watched it after the fact. Once round six happened, that was the end. But McGregor won the first four rounds, no doubt. I don't know if he won or if... May- I think Mayweather was just waiting. Was you like, know he what? He was like, I'm 40 years old. I'm just going to wait till he's sleepy. I'll tell you what, though. McGregor did hold his own for the first four rounds. It was a, it was good, but he has some awkward stances. You know why? Because he, he never boxed in his life. Yeah, I wish he would stop punching Mayweather in the back of his head, too. That's MMA, man. Every he's three been... seconds. He's like, bam, back the head. Hey, he Let's hung in there longer. Stop doing that. Hung in there longer than most people thought he would, so. Oh, yeah. Once round six happened, that it started was... to go down. Oh, no, round six was like, I'm surprised he survived. He survived another three rounds after that. They got into the tenth round. Barely into the 10th round when his arms were around his waist. It's like, I got nothing. Well, he held his right arm up for so long, just kind of giving him little face jabs. That's a long was time. Was it really jabs, down. or was it just like, eh, eh? He did better than I would have. He, oh, he did really good. I would have run around like a little baby going, please don't hit me, please don't hit me, please don't hit me. I would have done the opposite, like 75 million, just knock me out so I could get my money. Sound like Rocky for the rest of your life. I would do anything for 75 million. Asterisk, I would do anything that has 15 years or less of jail time for $75 million. I would still like to enjoy the money. Would you have somebody cut your leg off at the knee? Would you undergo an amputation of a body limb? Not sure, for $75 million? Just get a robot end. I don't think I could do that. I mean, $75 million is a lot, but have, there's something about the homeostasis of having a full functional body. No, oh, no, I'd happily cut anything off, as long as it's replaceable. Would you allow me to slap you across the face every day of the year for $75 million? Absolutely. Oh, so Patreon members, we're looking for $75 million. But I could, I do like a variety of things. Because like, I feel like I could. Like a, like a dead fish, some cheese. I feel like I could kill someone and get 15 years or less in prison time on good behavior. At this point, the... If you would pay me $75 million, I'll kill someone for you. At this point, the producers of the Editor's Note Comics podcast would like to reiterate, Zach is not actually an assassin. He is not a killer for hire, nor is he implying that he would engage in such services. I mean, I would, absolutely, and I am, actually, if you'd pay me that much money. I don't think I don't think you get your 15-year sentence now. It's on record and on file saying, <laughs> I will kill for money. You give me enough? Yes. Yeah, but then... Would you not... I would not kill somebody for money. Oh. You are going away forever. Give me that Mayweather money. I'll do what you want. I love the picture of them both on their own private jets with just a sack full of money in their lap. <laughs> what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, so... Oh, you're the... going to go to prison uh, for King... frigging ever? <laughs> King Kong or Godzilla will win this fight. You'll be, you would Let's be the definitive it's... loser in that situation. Not for that much money, I wouldn't be. Well, the guy you killed would be. Oh, yeah, that would be the loser. Would you kill me for $75 million? 100%. You are an asshole. <laughs> would even hesitate. Wow. That's that's cold, man. That is cold. That's a lot of money. Would you kill your wife for $75 million? No. Okay, so, wow. So you would kill me for $75 million? I imagine, yeah. It's nothing sacred. No, that's a lot of money. Friendship is priceless. Not that priceless. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's why I hate these hypotheticals, because then you get answers that you don't want to hear. I was hoping that you'd be like, no, man, I couldn't kill you for $75 million. Your lack of hesitation and the fact that the answer was on the tip of your tongue the moment I started to even speak. I mean, already we're 74 over what I would do it for. Wow. Let's go back to the news. Jesse Eisenberg has been cut from Justice League, supposedly. He was supposedly in it, and now he's supposedly out of it. I, I'm. I'll give you credit. You stood up for yourself. You're like, no. I thought he was good in that movie, and the world disagreed with you. Yeah. Well, I'm. I'm in a little bit of shock right now. <laughs> I'm still absorbing the fact that you would kill me for seventy five million. For one million dollars, you would kill me. Wow. It's a big zero. Yeah. It's a big zero on our on our value of our friendship. Apparently, some Joss Whedon news. It would. It would appear. <laughs> there is some Joss Whedon news. 
Uh, there's two levels of Joss Whedon news. Do we want the depressing or the weird? I'm I'm depressed right now because you're willing to kill me for your personal gain. So yeah, you'll. I was gonna say you'll live. You won't. No. <laughs> the opposite of that, you'll die. Well, this is. I've been giving you every Tuesday of my life for the last seventy five weeks, and this is how you repay me. Apparently. Can we have the sad Joss Whedon news now, please? Turns out he is a massive prick. Wah, wah. Yeah, did you see this? No, I, I didn't see this. I'm absorbing the fact that you're being a massive prick right now by saying you'd kill me for $75 million. Well, he separated from his wife five years ago, which was kept under wraps until May-ish, when the divorce was finalized. Or what people thought was a 25-year relationship. It was more like a 20-year relationship. And it turns out for 15 of those years, he f- a lot of people wow yeah his wife published an article on the rap as a guest contributor saying that he was a hypocrite for preaching feminist values when he was sleeping with his actresses co-workers friends and fans for 15 years and he didn't reveal it to her for a very long time i can see how that's a prick move yeah Produces good work, personally, shit guy. And he wrote her a letter that she published some of. It's like real weird. He's like, it was like a Greek myth. I had all of these needy, aggressive young women, but I couldn't touch them. And then she's like, except he did. And he had his first affair on the set of Buffy. And I did the math. So they broke up essentially five years ago. She's like, 15 years before is when he had his first affair. That would put it in 97. That would put it in the first half of Buffy season two. So, like, literally the second he got fame, he was banging someone else. Wow. Yeah. I'd like to point out that since the podcast has taken off, I'm not out there just throwing my wild wild seed to the wind. I mean, you could say there's, like, levels of gray and, like, we only have one half of the story. But she doesn't have anything to gain by publishing this stuff. I'm just going to say he's a shit guy. There you go. The other news is it came out that apparently, despite what we've heard, that the Justice League movie is still within Zack Snyder's vision. That has gone back and forth multiple times. We'll see what that actually means. I have no faith in the final product at this point. I have no faith in you right now in this moment. That's fine. Okay. It's mostly DC news this week. Oh, okay. And mostly movie news. There's barely any comics news. Uh, within the week, we've had some back and forth on Batman comments. Director Matt Reeves said that the Batman movie he's doing is going to be a standalone movie. It won't be connected to the rest of the DC universe, which everyone took as this is a separate thing and Affleck's out. Except then he clarified his comment saying, no, it's a standalone. And that just means I'm not going to have like random cameos and trying to build up the universe. It's just going to be a Batman movie, but still set within that universe. So Affleck's back in, baby. Baby. Yeah, Yeah, maybe, sort of, who the hell knows. Misconstrued. Speaking of DC news, last week we mentioned that there's going to be a Joker origin movie, maybe set as an Elseworld thing. This week it came out that there's going to be a Joker Harley movie coming out, and Gotham City Sirens, that was originally supposed to happen, is getting pushed back to maybe cancelled. And this one will star Jared Leto and Margot Robbie. Good, I'm glad. I want to see them. I was going to say, maybe don't. You're more positive than I am. Oh, I'd like to have a chance to see their characters flesh out a little bit more and less of Harley being a total sex object of the movie. And I want more Joker because I thought that Leto didn't get a chance to really flourish his idea of what the Joker was. But he also came out this week in an interview. He was like all that stuff about like method acting. That's all a bunch of crap. That's not real. It was just blown up in the media. The people who said that were your co-stars. They're like, yeah, he sent me a bunch of bullets with my initials on them. Or he boomeranged me a used condom or a dead rat. These weren't PR people. These were your co-stars, and I think you're backtracking for being a weirdo. Don't send people used condoms or dead rats. Or bullets with their initials on them. That one is less gross. It's still off-putting, and it's upsetting. Moving away from DC, going over to Marvel, for Jack Kirby's 100th birthday, we saw the reveal of Evangeline Lilly's wasp costume. Looks good. Yeah, that's about all I have to say about it. Typical female superhero costume. I don't know. It's not. Well, that's not very. It's not. It's, it's not revealing. It's no. fully armored. I actually say it's not your typical. Like there's. It's nothing, very Batmanish. I mean, she has a six pack chiseled into it. I don't think it's overly sexualized. It's I not like, like it. it's not like the vinyl ass that George Clooney had in uh, 
Batman and Robin. Oh, no, that was um, Val Kilmer and Batman and Robin. Yeah. No, you're mixing them up, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Gratuitous vinyl ass shot. I think it looks good. I mean, we'll see. It's certainly not the prototype we were shown in the post credit scene of Ant-Man. It's different, but I think it works. And there's also not a helmet on it so or the wings, so we'll have to see what that brings to the proceedings. But overall, it looks good. Yeah, I was impressed. More costume reveal news. Luke Cage Season 2 has apparently begun filming it. We saw Misty Knight with a lack of an arm and the addition of a robot arm. Yeah, it's your general generic TV robot arm. That... Yeah, it's a real TV budget robot arm, but still it's a robot arm, so hey. What was I read? I read the other day about how much money Netflix is going to put into original content. Like, it was in the billions of dollars. I think at this point they're just trying to, you know, put forward what they have because there's other streaming services coming out. Netflix has to go like, hey, look at this. They're going to whip it out, slap it on the table and say, look at how big this is. We have, I mean, they feel the need to keep up with all the other over the top streaming services, especially where Disney is going to pull all their stuff. And you got things now like you've got Roku, Amazon Prime, uh, Hulu. Was it Crackle? You lost, one? Yeah, you lost me the Roku one, but yeah. You've never heard of Roku? No. It's a similar service to like Fire Stick. Okay. And in a little bit of comic book news, in the Star Wars comics, Luke and Leia are going to react to the events of Rogue One. Oh, good for them. Isn't that neat, though, that we live in this world where you, the timeline's fluid and you can just have different things happen? It's canon now. Yeah, and the two of them are going to be able to officially react. Up until this point, Star Wars scribe Jason Aaron is going to be leaving the title replaced by Kieran Gillen, and he's going to have the two of them react to Rogue One, which I think sounds really cool. I'd like to see what Luke and Leia do with the information of that event. Ah. Oh, by the way, did you see this? Netflix partners with a dispensary for strains of weed based on 10 of its original series. No, I didn't see that. Yeah, they are. They have Camp Firewood for uh, Wet Hot American Summer 10 years later. Uh, Ever hear of BoJack Horseman? Yeah. They have it's called Prickly Muffin, Arrested Development, uh, Banana Stand Kush. Here's the one I know you've really been wondering about Pawusi Riot for Orange is the New Black. P O U S S E Y. Kicking it with, it's for kicking it with somebody, talking, and making mad, stupid jokes. Yeah, there you go. I've seen none of these. That's fine. Oh, uh, Grace and Frankie, POT73. And then I would like to introduce our new segment into the news. Yes. Recently rumored, the stupid news. Oh, the stupid news. It's back. Take it away, the stupid news theme. What is this? Oh, it's this week in stupid news. This is a new level of lame. I should play that for you at some point. You probably should, so I know what it sounds like. Is this, this is kind of like, I wish we'd brought back Where's the Beef Twitter. That was a good one, but I still like stupid news. This one's kind of where's the beef, I guess. Okay. James Cameron. Yes. Director of some of the best movies of all time. Terminator. Terminator 2. Aliens. End of list, I guess. Avatar? It's fine. Titanic? I don't really like it. Okay, whatever. The best is meh. All right, so go on. He came out this week and said that Wonder Woman was a step backwards it was just male hollywood patting themselves on the back and it was still an overly sexualized character and also in an attempt to jerk himself off he's like whoa i always want to tempt that when you take a character that i made like sarah connor like she was damaged and flawed and she went over the audience with grit and not with sexiness okay so he's he's self um flagellating yes that's what i was looking for and then patty jenkins director of wonder woman came out and she's and i'm paraphrasing here She's like, that's a bunch of crap. You don't need to be a damaged and gritty woman to be a strong and powerful woman. It's okay to be sexy and still be strong. James Cameron also mentioned that her uh, movie Monster, starring Shirley Theron, had a powerful female character, but he did not back Wonder Woman. She's like, I appreciate his kind of words about Monster, but he is 100% off base on this. And I have to agree. It's not a criticism you hear of like male-centric movies, not like, yeah, he's he was strong, but he's also sensitive. has a lot of abs. The number of abs you can count on him take away from his role as a strong man. You don't hear that. No, they're like, oh yeah, I want to see a guy with 20 abs. Yeah. It, his abs have abs. Yeah, I think Cameron was weirdly off base with this. And this was, um, he was giving a lot of information all at once. It's 
quite frank, it's not really taking it out of context. He was just asked about the movie and that was his response. So it was weird and I think he's off base and I think that falls under stupid news. Yep, that's stupid news. Just because Patty Jenkins doesn't have your weird mother fetish and if you think I'm being weird about that statement, think about every movie James Cameron has done with a strong female character. Here we go again. It's all mother characters. He has a weird mother fetish. Also, do you guys want to hear something special for our 100th? I timed it out, and that's the week Black Panther comes out. Oh, okay. Do you guys want something more than just a regular show? Yes, no, maybe let me know. Like, I can yeah. try and, I don't know, maybe get an interview or something, or oh. what the hell. If you want to throw out ideas for a 100th anniversary show, I can tell you it's Black Panther week, and it would be weird not to talk about it. Black maybe... Panther week? Yeah. Okay, good to it, know. Yeah, it's in the, whenever that is in February, that's our 100th episode. Is it Valentine's week? Uh, I don't remember. I'd have to look it up. So from there, let's go into our rarely done topic of an editor's education. For if knowledge is power, then a god am. It's time to get an editor's education. I think I have that sound clip. I wow. hope I do. It's a lot. If not, that's going to be real awkward. <laughs> I'd just like to have a quick pause. This past week, we saw Jack Kirby's 100th birthday. Um, the day of recording, it happened yesterday. So one day. I said this on Twitter yesterday, because I've only been on Twitter basically for as long as the show has existed. Or not the show, the store. Yesterday, at least for me personally, was the most positive day I have ever seen on Twitter. Because also, when I hopped on Twitter, it was like pre-election time, and it was post-election and all that, and a lot of Twitter is pretty negative. And all of yesterday was positive. You must have put a sunshine and rainbows filter on. There's a lot of bad shit going on in the world right now. There was other stuff. I mean, all of the stuff in Houston, and assorted shootings, because there were many of them, but... Missile launches. That too. But for the most part, people were celebrating Jack Kirby, and his incalculable legacy yeah contributions to the world of comics so for this segment i just wanted to give a recap of jack kirby's life and then we'll go into one of the most popular arcs he's ever done jack kirby was born august 28th 1917 under the name of jacob kurtzberg because surprise surprise like so many jewish creators he did end up changing his name later on in his young life, he lived in New York. He was in many childhood street gangs. And it was even told that he would take the subway to other areas of New York to learn other gangs' fighting styles. Wow. Jack was a badass. I see that. When he was a boy, he was brought into the Free School of the Education Alliance and was immediately kicked out for using up all of the chalk on the board because Jack was such a prolific artist. He could draw incredibly fast. And they're like, hey, stop using up our materials. Get out of here, kid. When he grew older, his father lost his job and he was forced to go into work to try and help support his family. He had a $15 a week paycheck working at Max Fleischer Studios. Fleischer to this day is you know, known for doing Popeye and the Superman cartoons, things of that nature. Eventually, because of the stock market crash, the studio closed in 1938 and Jack was out of work. In the mid-1940s, he met his wife, Roz. She lived in an upstairs apartment, which made dating her really easy because they would just have to go up and down stairs, especially in this time of essentially financial trouble. And the two of them would stay married until his death. That's good. She was absolutely his partner in life. And there are a million sweet photos of the two of them together. Like, these two were the real deal. Uh, following the closure of the Max Fleischer Studios, Jack Kirby was doing freelance work, and then he went to National Comics, where he met Joe Simon. National at the time was the predecessor to DC. In there, he would do work with Joe Simon. His first superhero that he ever did was the Blue Beetle. Not the current Blue Beetle, but a different one. Jack's first superhero work was doing inking on the character that Joe Simon was writing. Eventually, Simon started working with Kirby exclusively doing all this penciling because of the speed and quality that Kirby could produce. Unfortunately, the two of them weren't making enough money for the work that they were doing, and Jack Kirby and Joe Simon went off and rented their own separate apartment where they could do freelance work, and Jacob Kurtzberg changed his name to Jack Kirby so that the publishers at National wouldn't know what he was doing. Martin Goodman at the time, who was running 
timely comics, the precursor to Marvel. He changed the name around of the company a lot for tax purposes that are unclear, but certainly duplicitous. Very much unscrupulous. Yeah. Martin Goodman hired Joe Simon, who brought Jack Kirby with him, and that's when they made their first big hit, which, of course, is still well known today, of Captain America. Captain America number one shows Captain America punching Adolf Hitler straight in the face. That's a winning combination right there. Yep. The two of them did a lot of work for Marvel at that point, and that's where Jack Kirby met a young Stan Lee, who's First name was Stanley. He just broke the name up into two parts to sound less Jewish. Because unfortunately, that's what creators had to do at the time. Uh Uh-oh. Kirby, at least in his work and his projection of himself, always owned up to his Jewish heritage. Stanley, much less so. But Stanley at the time was a gopher. Martin Goodman was his uncle. And he worked just as a gopher for Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. He's like, hey, do you need coffee, Mr. Simon? Mr. Kirby? Uh Uh-oh. That kind of deal. Funny how the fates turned. Yeah. Captain America was a smash hit, and Simon and Kirby weren't seeing any real money from it. Like, Martin Goodman was making a ton of money off of it, but he would be like, oh no, I'm not actually making any money because all of the money from Captain America is going back into XYZ, and XYZ was really his own pocketbook. Simon and Kirby wanted to go back to National Comics, again, D.C., Because they heard that Siegel and Schuster, the creators of Superman, were getting real bank out of that company. Side note, they, in the long run, got literally nothing. But at the time, they were getting money. So they wanted to go back to that company because they weren't getting enough out of Timely. They were going to do this under the radar, but someone ratted them out and they were fired on the spot. It has never been confirmed one way or the other, but both Simon and Kirby believe that it was Stan Lee who ratted them out to Martin Goodman. Stan Lee denies this to this day, but the two of them strongly believe it was him, and there's really no proof to say if it was or was not. It probably was. But around this time is when World War II was getting into high action, and Jack Kirby went off to serve his country. Good for Jack. Yeah, he did. He quotes his time in the war as the only time he ever regretted being an artist, because his job, once they discovered who he was, was to be the first guy out and he would have to sketch the battlefield for his superior officer. So he would literally be the first guy to go out like, maybe there's a landmine. Maybe there are guys with guns. He doesn't know. (laughs) But he has to literally go sketch the battlefield and he says that's the only time he ever regretted being an artist. (laughs) Which sounds terrifying. Like, all right, we don't know what's out there. Go draw it. (laughs) You go. You tell us what's there with pictures. (laughs) Yeah. And you know what? Don't take a camera. Let's draw. But doesn't that sound terrifying? It sounds extremely terrifying. Kirby came back from the war. Obviously, he survived. He's married to Roz at this point. And superhero comics are basically obsolete. Post-war, no one needs these larger-than-life heroes to inspire them. That's just gone. Yeah, because they have the veteran. They have the people who fought the war. Yeah. And Jack gets into a company that's publishing romance comics. Still to this day, romance comics are still the most successful run of comics in history as far as, like, increase of numbers. Really? Yeah, post-war romance comics are the best-selling comics of all time. That's where the baby boomers come from. There's the romance comics. Banging. It's the romance comics. Yeah, that's what did it. Kirby, it wasn't, it Kirby wasn't, grew a generation. It wasn't, oh my god, I survived the war, and now I just want to go home and make babies and have families. No, no, it's... It's Jack oh, Kirby, baby. Jack Kirby and his, his lewd comics is, is... Well, it's funny, is they were viewed by many people as being, like, semi-pornographic. If you were to look at them now, they're, like, barely PG. His his livacious, lustful magazines. And beyond that, he also would do some horror comics. It was just kind of like playing the mark at the time. Like, oh, this is the thing. Go do this. Oh, this is the thing. Go do this. And then in the 1950s, kind of post the communist scare, you had a guy, Frederick Wortham, who I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on. If you know comics, you probably know the name. But he basically went on a witch hunt for comics saying that comics were ruining the youth. And he wrote a book, Seduction of the Innocent, saying that it was, like, increasing suicides and violence and all this other stuff and sexualization. And he went to Congress, and then comics came up with their own form of policing the Comics Code Authority, the CCA, which was just saying, like, you can't have horror or showing figures of authority being inept or sexualization or murder and all this other stuff. So you would get all these weird things like the Magia, which was the mafia but just one letter off ah or i know they used an example in court like 
look at this giraffe's head coming through this zoo cage that's cool like a penis going through a vagina like weird stuff okay and like you couldn't have vampires and werewolves and all this other stuff so there's a real threat to the comic book industry i have a lot of trouble uh measuring the worth of frederick wortham and the selection of the innocent book there has been a lot of reports that it was detrimental to comics there's also been reports that it's also been sensationalized to make it seem like a bigger deal than it was i really can't speak to it because i've heard both sides and quite frankly i'm not sure take it as you will do more research i'm not going to say that it was the worst thing ever formulate your I mean, own opinion it, it was bad but it might not be as bad as people like to make it out to be i can't i honestly can't tell fair enough after that romance comics horror comics that kirby was doing all tanked and he had to do the thing he said he would never do he would go back to marvel where wouldn't you know it stan lee is running things Oh, I'm sure that made Jack feel well, really... Well, he, he's not running things at that point, but he has worked his way up to being one of the head writers. Martin Goodman, the publisher from before, is still there. And after a few years, Stan wants to leave Marvel. As the story goes, his wife said, uh, Joni, who recently passed away, said, go do a kind of book that you would want to do, and then you can quit. And Stan came up with the idea of the Fantastic Four that he did it with Jack, and that kicked off the Marvel Age of Comics, and that led them into... Fantastic Four, X-Men, The Avengers, Iron Man, bring Captain America back, Ant-Man, The Hulk, everything, but not Spider-Man and Daredevil, even though Jack's involvement in that is questionable to this day. Maybe he designed them, maybe he didn't. Seriously, I, I can't speak to it. Okay. It's, it's either he did all of it, he did none of, it, none of it, or he did some of it. One of those? That's not really narrowing it down specifically. That's like no. There's that's like lot... saying where can I meet people, and it's like well, there's people inside and people outside. Look at one of those two places. Yeah, that's um, the equivalence of Jack's involvement on Spider-Man and Daredevil. He could have. He might not have. He maybe didn't. It's probably one of those things. Yeah, there are different reports. Okay, that's real specific. But Jack did work for Marvel starting in 1961 until the early 1970s and things had become strained he eventually did leave part of this was due because of a lack of money that he was getting for the work that he created and there was a big one he had done a poster for hulk promotional art and to take away from him getting the money marvel had another artist sketch over his hulk drawing in its entirety but changed the face so it didn't like kirby's art and when that happened kirby was like at this point, you are now blatantly screwing me over, so I'm done. And he left. At that point, he went over to DC Comics yet again for those who were counting the third time. It was DC at this point. Okay. Uh, he was working on Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, and then from there he spun out and did all of his fourth world stuff, which introduced the new gods. It was not well received at the time of publication. People thought it was a little too high concept. In later years, it did eventually become a hit, but at the time, no one liked it. Now people love it. It's regarded insanely well. But eventually he had to leave DC. He did a little bit of work for Marvel and DC after that. He did come back to do the Silver Surfer with Stan Lee one last time for an adaptation of what we're going to talk about next. There was going to be a Silver Surfer movie that never happened, so Stan and Jack did an adaptation of the script together. Also, the Silver Surfer has sex with himself by an, another character, which is also the Silver Surfer. It's a weird thing. That's extremely weird. Yeah. By this point in career, his career, Jack had been long known as the king of comics. Stan Lee, starting the pages of Fantastic Four, and like 20-something issues. Stan has started doing all these like fun kind of captions of things, and Jack was known as the king of comics. By this point in his career... He was known as the king of comics in a derogatory, condescending kind of way. Like, oh yeah, he's the king of comics. He lost most of his vision, so his art had become a little wonky at this point. Like, he just physically couldn't do it as well as he used to be able to. But he was still working. Um, after leaving Marvel and DC fully, he did some animation work, which actually included some Fantastic Four animation work, which was kind of weird. So, like, uh, the old Fantastic Four cartoon, which had the thing reed sue and instead of johnny because they don't want kids setting themselves on fire herbie the robot he was doing all that stuff he's working on herbie he went back to the old days of animation what's, where he what's started wrong with setting yourself on fire don't do that it's not worth 
And he went to work on to other companies like Tops. But the advantage that he had there is he got to retain the rights of his own creations and his own characters, which he didn't have at Marvel or DC. There were also big lawsuits later in his career, especially in the 80s, about trying to get money and also trying to get his original art back. Marvel retained all of the art, and they also shredded a ton of it. And there were a lot of creators, um, most prominently Neil Adams, who stepped forward and tried to do this whole legal case, getting people's art back and rights for the artists and things like healthcare and all of that, which, I mean, my opinion of, like, current day Neil Adams is totally off his rocker, but if he also wants to make a career for himself being Neil Adams. But on the other hand, he also did a ton of seminal work, and he also did a ton of work for creators who have nothing. So, overall, good guy. Good guy. Yeah, what are you going to say? Don't read his current stuff, but good guy. <laughs> and there was a big lawsuit, and Kirby got a lot of his artwork back. In the later years, when he was doing stuff for Tops and all that, he had a lot of decreasing health issues, and I guess like a lot of people would come up to him, and they'd be like, hey, oh my god, you're Jack Kirby. When he started getting like real recognition, like, can you sign this thing? He would say, like, oh, I can't. I'm under contract where I can only like sign prints and sell certain things. But the other side of it is his health was so bad, like, he couldn't physically sign anything. And he couldn't really see either. Hmm. Which is, like, he really, unfortunately, didn't get recognition for his work until basically the end of his life, which is sad. He did die on February 6th, 1994, in his home. He went out to get the paper, came back in, and died from heart failure. And from there, his wife, Roz, did get money from Marvel, and she only lived a couple of years after that. But that's kind of Jack Kirby's life in a nutshell. First educators, uh, the first editor's education segment is... No, we just haven't done it in like 50 episodes. Yeah, it's quite a, <laughs> quite a lot there. Jack Kirby, whether you know his work or not, he had imagination before things existed. A lot of people look at his fourth world stuff they did for DC as a precursor to Star Wars. He just didn't get credit for it. The work that he's done has shaped not just pop culture, but western culture as an entirety his work is mega seminal but i think he's the most influential artist on american culture that ever existed comic books one of the only two original american art forms jack kirby is the guy who has shaped american culture oh well, his fingerprints are all over i mean think about things like the superheroes that we have, like Captain America for certain. There are people that he's influenced. I mean, he's even influenced, like, there are um, rock bands who have come up with, like, we're inspired by Jack Kirby or, like I said, Star Wars or space operas or anything. Like, Jack Kirby is everywhere in current Western culture. The father. Very cool. That's what I have to say. There you go. Let's move on, now that I've done that. Let's move on from there to Jared's Reading Corner. Jared's Reading Corner. <laughs> corner all right so obviously staying with the theme of jack kirby we're taking a look at uh one of the most famous arcs he ever did the silver surfer arc i am being handed the omnibus right now you could kill a homeless man with that that thing is heavy for seven hundred fifty thousand yeah, dollars less wow okay generally referred to as the galactus trilogy we're going to be covering fantastic four number 48 through 50 can i just point something out here real quick the watcher looks like a big fat baby. No, even before that, when these people write in for the uh, the fan club pages, the letters, yeah, fans, they're giving these people's addresses. So if like this guy Jim Reynolds, uh, forty three twenty Starlington Drive in Boise, Idaho, if he wrote something and you disagreed with it, you could like totally mail the guy and be like, "Hey, you're an idiot, Jim," uh, or Jack Hoffman. Or, or Jack Holman. Sorry, Jack Holman, not Jack Hoffman. If That'd be an unfortunate Jack name. Hoffman, yes. <laughs> It's actually really fun reading these old Fantastic Four letters pages. You'll get a lot of people who would come into Marvel later on. But the biggie for me is George R. R. Martin would write in all the time. And he actually said that the reason that he got into writing and wanted to publish his own work was kind of the thrill that he got out of what he saw in the fan pages of the Fantastic Four. Like he would write in, it would get published, and that like gave him like this big kind of personal high. And that's why Game of Thrones exists. Yeah, that's right, baby. Fantastic Four. I love, I'm reading this, like, right before we get the issue coming, the coming of Galactus. Stan and Jack created Fantastic Four number 48 just for you because it's too fabulous to waste on strangers. <laughs> Some of the writing. So anyway, into our, our story arc. The first part of the coming of Galactus. Well, it comes has... out March 1966, written by Stan Lee, 
Pencils by Jack Kirby and inked by probably Jack's best inker, Joe Sinnott. Yes. And letters by Artie Siamek, you know, take it or leave it. It could be him or Sam Rosen. They're kind of interchangeable. Yes. Sorry. But the beginning of this is we're, they're dealing with Magnus the Magnificent. It has nothing Maximus. to do. Maximus. Maximus, whatever. I didn't. I kind of. I was like, all right, whatever. This is this is the wrapping up of the previous storyline. Yeah, it is. Which is the Inhumans. Which yeah. yeah, unfortunate for you. Like, if you're just going into this, like, I'm gonna read the Galactus trilogy. That's super famous. Oh, Maximus, uh, brother of um, Black Bolt, real name Blackagar Boltagon, shot a gun at the Earth, and everything vibrated. Yeah, it's fine now. They solve it real yeah, quick. It was yeah, a real simple solution. So anyway, also Blackagar Boltagon. I love how they just, the transition's so quick. So it's like moments later, back in their charter jet, blah, blah, blah. But life goes on, and somewhere in the deep vanness of the outer space, an incredible figure hurtles through the cosmos. This figure, of course, is, well, it's the Silver Surfer. So, and, and by the way, I love how he looks in this. He's like getting ready to, he's like, party on, everybody. Party on, Garth. Party on, Wayne. So, fun note about the Silver Surfer. Back in this time of Marvel Comics, Jack Kirby is known for his speed and quality, and what he would do, him and Stan would talk out a storyline, and then Jack would go off and draw it, and he would give the pages to Stan. A lot of times Stan would even remember what they talked about. But in this instance, Jack decided that the character Galactus needed a herald, and he invented the Silver Surfer. It was not something him and uh, Stan had talked about at all. So Stan got the pages back. He's like, the hell is this? <laughs> who, who is this guy? He's the Silver Surfer. And that's what they came up with. And Stan ended up making him a very, like, tragic Shakespearean character. But at the time, like, Jack was like, oh, yeah, that's a guy I made up. Work around it. So he does. And we get some Skrills. This is my first experience with the Skrills. You keep on saying Skrills. It's Skrills. Skrills, whatever. I Um, enjoyed cutting the last episode. You're like, Skrills! Skrills, Skrills, whatever. And then... They uh, They got grills on their teeth, these Skrills. Yeah. Meanwhile, back on Earth, apparently two suns and then the sky catcher's on fire. What's going on? Everybody's freaking out. So, of course, the human torch is like, oh, I got this. You know, and he does his little clapper thing instead of like, you know, flame on. That's really, really dumb way to activate your superpowers. Everything is on fire. I know how to solve this. Flame I, on. I, too, shall be on fire. <laughs> he's like, and then, blend it in. Then, then immediately he's, he's swept out of the air by two guys with a hook. Where the hell did they get a garden hose in the middle of the city? One guy's throwing a brick. The other guy's got a hose. This is not going well for the Human Torch. They're like, stop setting things on fire, the Human Torch. Have at thee. We have bricks. And they take him out. Oh, yeah. They take him out pretty quickly. Johnny is no good at this. Johnny kind of sucks. Uh, that's what he gets for being in um, Stan Lee's writing, a teen hyphen ager. Mm-hmm. Stan Lee writes teenagers so eloquently. Doesn't he ever? He, side note, does doesn't. not. Yeah. Teenagers are the hippest of folks. So anyway, there's a whole lot going on. And all of a sudden, Reed kind of goes missing for a couple of days in his lab. And Sue, recently married, uh, if, I, if I'm if i not uh, incorrect. Uh, I can't remember if they're either just got married or if... I'm pretty sure they just got married. They're about because, to get married. I can't remember. Uh, I think you go back uh, and then you had the... To save you, I must take. Oh, maybe it was after this. Maybe they get married after this. They, I honestly can't remember. Uh, well, point notwithstanding, she's not happy with him. They get married around this time. Yeah. Well, I mean, the end of the earth is kind of a that kind of provokes you to doing that. Finally, Sue's like, "I'm coming into your lab," and then in there, well, we have the, the Watcher. Watcher. I love if you've read a lot of Jack Kirby's work, you know his walk. Kirby always has a very specific gait for people walking. It's very dynamic. What's really funny about seeing Sue do it is because, you know, she is womanly and dainty. She has impossibly small ankles. Oh, yeah. She doesn't even have ankles. It's bone. Yeah. But, I mean, there's a very... So, anyway, the Watcher is working on a matter mobilizer because he is going to try and obscure Earth from the vision of the Silver Surfer, who is the herald of Galactus. And he's like, oh, yeah, this is a great planet. You can come down here and consume all the elements and and feast on this planet. They're delicious. Galactus likes to eat planets. Yeah, well, unfortunately for everybody involved, the Silver Surfer shows up, uh, and, well, he's like, oh, this is perfect. He sends up his... Uh, a lot of stuff happening here. Yeah. I see there's a New York City. I'm going to check it out. Not a lot of people ever go here. Or do they? Yes. 
So the thing takes care of everything by punching him, like knocking him out. He hits him so hard he turns turns the Silver Surfer invisible. We really love like in future issues we'll like have the Silver Surfer be like this one of the strongest characters in Marvel. Here in his first confrontation, the thing takes him out in one punch. Yes. That will change in the future, but I do love this first introduction. He's like, that's enough of you! Yes, it is exactly enough of him. Uh, and then, oh, well, guess who shows up? Galactus. Who, that oh. is, he's dumb looking. I'm going to just go out and let him and say it. We see Galactus for the first time, and thankfully he never looks like this again. No. He changes immediately in the next issue. He has the classic Galactus design to a point... Um, instead of having like full sleeves on his arms, he has short sleeves and he is colored like a Christmas tree in green and red and it looks dumb as hell. Yes. Thank God that look is never seen for- again. And in certain reprints that you can get of this issue, they totally redo the coloring to give him more of like the galac- um, the classic Galactus coloring. But boy, the way he looks originally is silly as hell. Meanwhile... Some of these letters again, as we're at the end of this. Dear Stan and Jack, I'd like to comment on the letter written by a fan after Fantastic 445. He implies something to the effect that Super Richards is a stuck-up snob uh, for treating Johnny like dirt with phrases like impetuous kid brother and baby brother. I found such phrases used only three times in the same two issues, so on and so forth. And then here's the response. How right you are, pussycat. I love reading Stan's responses in the old letter pages. My favorite is, it's earlier on, but when they're t- they talk about it, I'm like, communism and like one reader gets offended they're like should you really be calling like the russians reds and stan writes back he's like call a spade a spade and a red a red there it is stuff like that so we move on to the second issue if this be doomsday yes and like we talked about last week stan lee's love of alliteration is all over the place the masterful manner of stan lee the magnificent mode of jack kirby the majestic mood of joe sanat and lettered in the nick of time by Rosen. S. Rosen. S. Rosen. And then we see Galactus, who has completely changed his color scheme. He's all purple and red. Which is funny because, I mean, this was like the time of purple villains for Marvel. Like, they did the Frightful Four, which was the Wizard, Sandman, Medusa, and Pace Pop Pete. And it was basically like the purple brigade of villains. And then we also have Galactus, who is also purple. And at this point in time, Marvel just like purple villains. It works. A lot of them would change that color scheme later, but not Galactus. Galactus ran away from his Christmas colors and just stuck with purple forever. Called it good. Galactus also kicks the ever living crap out of the Fantastic Four. Because, hey, he's Galactus. He can do what he wants. I do love how Ben gets knocked out almost immediately and Reed just wraps him up and rolls away. Yes. Like he's a towel. He's a rolled up towel and he just rolls away and it's amazing. I like it. The art is really cool on that where he's just like, huh? Eh? I'm rolled up. So Kirby anyway. always wanted to try and do a lot. He did the most he ever could with Reed. It's like, what can Reed do this time? And sometimes it would be things that physically didn't make sense. But this one where Reed is just a log and rolls away, that one works. Mm. Elsewhere, in other parts of town, the Silver Surfers passed out on some woman's couch. Alicia Marsters, that's Ben Grimm's blind girlfriend. Ah. Who supposedly looks identical to Sue, which makes Johnny hooking up with her much later on super weird. Reasonable. If it, she supposedly looks exactly like your sister. Moving on. The Silver Surfer is like confused. unconscious after getting punched by Ben. I would be too. And he wakes up. He's like, ah, what is this world? You should probably all die. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, you're hungry. Let me make you some food. This is where it goes downhill. You pass out on some girl's couch, she makes you food in the morning, and you get all whoop de doo and who knows, you're willing to do anything for anybody. This has literally never happened to you. No, it hasn't. So, the Watcher's like, listen, I really am not allowed to, uh... Interfere? Interfere here. He's been around before. He's from the dark side of the moon. Yeah, so he's like, I'm not really allowed to interfere, but, uh... dark side of the moon. But Galactus is building a world-ending machine on top of the Baxter building, so you might want to do something about it. I'll give you an idea what you need to do. I can't do it for you. You probably should send Johnny. Side note, I'll send him to where you need to be to get a weapon of infinite destruction. Don't worry about it. I'm still not interfering. It's like a little kid, like, putting his finger in your face, like, not touching you, not touching touching you. you, still not touching you. Except this is more helpful than that. Yes. 
back at the apartment of the blind sculptor, Alicia Marsters. Alicia Marsters. Uh, she makes the Silver Surfer food, and he goes like, oh, eating is far too wasteful, and he just absorbs it, all of the energy. <laughs> and then he starts absorbing the waste of her apartment, too. He's like just taking everything in her apartment, and she starts beating on him. He's real green. He doesn't understand things. But he's like, I serve Galactus. I'm going to destroy the world. Sorry about that, but I did enjoy your sandwiches and cronuts. Yes, those were wonderful. Meanwhile, back on top of the Baxter building, uh, the thing says, oh, you know what? I'm going to break all these machines, and you can re- you can rebuild them, and I'll break them, because I'm going to buy us time. Which, I mean, in all fairness, so like, Ben, it's useless. He's like, at least I'm doing something, and I'm kind of with Ben at that point. Like, you know yeah. what? Better than doing nothing. And then Galaxus flips him the bird. Uh, mostly. It's, it's supposed to be the bird, but it's really his index finger. And then uh, the Watcher transforms Johnny to send him through space and time travel and distortion. And he sends him off to get this... Uh, he sends him to Galactus' home planet, which is a giant space station. Meanwhile... To get a device of unknown origin. Yes. And then it says, meanwhile, countless galaxy, galaxies are what we find. Oh, a fight between um, Punisher... Not the Punisher. Just a little green, purple, and blue guy. It is the Punisher at the time. This is well before the Punisher. But I do think it's funny that there was a Punisher that predated Frank Castle's The Punisher. And Ben and the Punisher have it out. Oh, that's a good little fight. A good little bit of sport. Uh, and then Sue has to use a force field to protect them. Again. And then... Uh, Only Sue's doing something. Well, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of stories previous to this where Sue is just the lady. The lady. And now... And a stunning twist, the Silver Surfer's like, you know what, maybe I like Earth, because this woman made me food, so I'm going to go fight Galactus. It's like when I make you mac and cheese, you're like, you know what, I'll keep doing this show. Yeah, but now that you've decided that I'm worth killing for money, the do Watcher's you, like... Do you not have a price? Uh, I have a conscience. I have morals. You have no price. You really have no price. Uh, depends on what it is. I don't think I could kill anybody for money. Yeah, we disagree yeah well we're allowed to do that meanwhile let's um continue on the first page again has a little bit of uh stanley alliteration this time it's peerless pageantry at the peak of proud perfection or they're gonna say the startling saga of the silver surfer there may also be that yes and galactus is at his world destroying machine and the silver surfer just surfs on up kind of hangs 10 floats in and they have a fight and he's actually able to like contain him for a short period of time. And then Galactus breaks out and says, Huh, this is a stunning turn of events that my herald is turned against me. Why aren't you on board with mass murder? Yes. And the Silver Surfer is like, well, this woman made me some sandwiches. It was very nice. <laughs> that is really all it is. It's like, I had a nice lunch. Yeah. That's ex- what of it, Galactus? Yeah. There is such a thing as a free lunch, apparently. Meanwhile, Johnny returns... I can also sense them. The mists are clearing, he says. And then he shows up. I'm back. The Watcher did it. And he brought me through universe. He brought me through infinity. And then uh, he brings out this weapon that's supposed to be special. Johnny has brought back with him the one, the only, the handheld ultimate nullifier. You know what? I like to have an ultimate nullifier. (laughs) It looks like a piece of space junk. Just a radio remote control. Yeah, pretty much. And Johnny, who has gone through space and time, gives it to Reed and Reed's like, I'll take credit for this, shoves it in Galactus's face. He's like, bitch, I'll pull this button. Yeah, I don't even know what this button will do, but I'll push it. I like this line where he's talking to the Watcher Galactus. You've given a match to a child that lives in a tinderbox. So Galactus goes, well, I suppose I don't think this is a win-win situation. Destroy everything, including me, or let them keep Earth. So, I'm going to leave. Side note, Silver Surfer, you're stuck here forever. Galactus out! Yeah. He turns Silver Surfer into something, you know, still powerful, but he just can't roam the galaxy anymore. There's a forest field around the Earth. Yeah. And then Johnny goes to college. What an interesting development. Yep, that's about all I have from there. Because, really, there's nothing to do with... Yeah, I love this, that they didn't know how big it was going to be at the time, because, like, even on the cover, they're like, don't miss this exciting issue where Johnny Storm finally goes to college. Little did they know. Like, See, this also ties in, because it's back to school week here. In 1966? Right now, it's back to school week this week. Yeah. I really enjoyed reading that. That was a fun story. Um, great art. I enjoyed the hell out of it. I don't think it's the 
best of Jack Kirby or even the best of his Fantastic Four, but it is certainly the most well-known, and it's still really damn good. I'm partial because I have the silver bullet in my hand. Do you think the Silver Surfer drinks the silver bullet? No, he is too lean for that. Oh, he's busy eating sandwiches. I think the downside of it is Johnny getting the ultimate nullifier, which is very much plot convenient. Like, how are we going to get rid of this guy? Oh, I don't know. The Watcher will send you off to go get this thing you've never heard of before. (laughs) Ha ha, you win. Yeah, goodbye. That that is the downside of the story. But overall, I mean... It's like, oh, we made this guy who's unbeatable. How are we going to beat him? The nullifier. The ultimate nullifier. Yeah, just not any kind of nullifying. The ultimate amount of nullifying. Yeah. But that is kind of our celebration of Jack Kirby's 100th birthday. Uh, If you want to get this, it's in a bunch of places. There's the Omnibus. There's Marvel Masterworks. I'm sure it's been reprinted about a billion other times. But if you want to find us, go to editorsnotecomics.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. If you want to get the show a day early, you can go to patreon.com slash editorsnotecomics. One dollar a month will get you this show a day early every single week, unless something weird happens, like Jared goes to visit the Amish. And you can get my other show, The Buffy Back Issue Bin, a full week early. What's so weird about going to visit the Amish? It's not going to be coming Amish. No, you're not. You got a problem with Mennonites? No. Okay, just checking. But the They bu- make quality furniture. And you can find me on Twitter, at Junior Rich. And maybe there's a thing I'll be throwing out on Twitter this week about him. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. I think so. I hope so. We'll see. I, like I said, we're not going to count our, our chickens before they hatch. We're taking it a day at a time. What's on the show next week? We're having to change the schedule from my original plan. Yes. Next week, because I feel strongly on the topic, even though it's already been out on digital for two weeks, just came out on Blu-ray today when we're recording, I've watched it and immediately went, oh yeah, we have to talk about this. We're doing the Batman and Harley Quinn direct DVD movie, a continuation of Batman the Animated Series, because boy, I have thoughts, and it can't be untouched. And they're probably not very good thoughts. I don't need to know about Harley's farting or her vibrator. Wow. All that and more next week. Yeah. On the Editor's Note Comics podcast. Happy birthday, Jack.